Welcome to Digital Asset News, take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today, we've really got two stories. And the big story is what is going on with the economy, the traditional markets, and the Bitcoin halving. So as we can see right now, coin market cap, uh, or as I call it, Binance market cap, we're doing pretty well here. Looks like Bitcoin is at 9807, and that is happening right now at around one o'clock Texas time. And uh, it looks like uh, it is going to possibly break that 10,000 barrier. But you can see all the different other coins out there. They are just kind of holding on, except for looks like Crypto.com, Monero, and Unis said Leo. Well, good for them. But uh, the big story here is Bitcoin. Will it hit 10,000 today as the Bitcoin halving is coming up in roughly four days? We will see. I think it might. And uh, the big question, though, is what's going to happen after the Bitcoin having. So let's jump into today's stories. So first up, this actually got me thinking. It was a tweet by Anthony Pompliano. If you don't know Anthony, just called, but he goes by Pomp. He's been on CNBC, Fast Money. He's uh, He's got his own blog post and all the different things. And um, uh, he's uh, really into the space. And he asked this question, right? Or he has, makes a statement. He says, more than 30 million Americans lost their jobs in the last seven weeks. And somehow the NASDAQ is up on the year. And then he just goes on to state, and it's a good point because, I mean, to me, it makes no sense. How is it that what's happening on Main Street doesn't correlate with what's happening on Wall Street? And then he asks the question down here. He goes, he understands that, but the tech sector is not immune to the impact of the virus. Look at the layoffs from Uber, Airbnb as examples. And uh, I actually uh, did a little comment. And I said, yeah, but you have to understand that uh, with Uber, I mean, it's a technology company, but not too many people are driving around or need to be driven places. Uh, a lot of different uh, areas in the United States are still locked down, so they're not going too far. And as far as Airbnb, I'm on Airbnb, and uh, I rent out uh, one of my properties on Airbnb, and uh, all my listings have been slashed by 90%. So even though they are technology, the underlying um, structure of what it actually serves is uh, really rooted in day-to-day -day operations, and that's why those are floundering. So this question really got answered uh, on the CNBC uh, show where they talked about, and they had, well, they talked about the economy and Wall Street, Main Street versus Wall Street. And um, they had on Jenny Harrington. She's the CEO at Gilman Hill Asset Management. And some of the things she said made a lot of sense. And some of the things that she says were just bat crazy. Um, but I, before we start, there was somebody in the comment section had a really good point. And they told me, they go, look, they go, look, man, the economy is what's happening right now. You can look out your window. You can see that everything's going you know, to hell in a handbasket. But the stock market is what's happening in the future or what people perceive to be happening in the future. So my question is this before we even start. Do you believe that the market will recover in one month? How about two months? How about 12? How about 18? And, and so what do you think of as far as like the whole economic recovery is going to take? Because the way that some of these people talk, it's like it's going to be next month and everything's going to be good. Some people are more realistic to like, no, it's going to be like, you know, 12 months to 18 months. And some people are just crazy and they think it's just going to be magically fixed. I just don't get it. But that's that's why I ask everybody who listens to the, the video, such as you, to see what your thoughts are. But if it's if it's greater than six months, which I think it is going to be, my question then is why keep your money into the traditional market if you think it's going to drop? Because if you think if you're still playing the traditional markets and you're inside, you're like, well, you know, in the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, uh, I'm just going to keep pumping money in, even though I know it's going to drop. It makes no sense. So when we see like all these different markets actually going up, I believe that people think that this whole recovery is going to happen and I'm going to make a lot of money in the traditional stock market. We've already bottomed out. I just don't see it. Anyhow, so Jenny Harrington comes on and uh, she's going to talk about the S&P 500. Now, as a reminder, the S&P 500 is an index that allows you to buy the top 500 companies in the stock market. Unfortunately, right now, five companies, just five, make up 20% of the S&P 500, with a, which is, to me, a huge consolidation of power. And I like to refer to them as uh, MAGA Facebook, and that's Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, and Facebook itself. And just as a refresher, I actually didn't know this uh, until like a couple weeks ago, 
where I found this on Fortune magazine. It says five companies now make up 18%. This was back in February 11th. Now it's 20% of the S&P 500. And they name them right here. Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. So a lot of tech companies. But these are all tech companies that you know you can you use in the comfort of your own home, right? Not like Uber and not like Airbnb, uh, especially Amazon. I see Amazon as a big winner uh, for these whole situations because Amazon is being used like crazy. Anyhow, I just wanted to make mention of that before we go to the video. I know in this this first section, Jenny here is going to say four companies, but I still believe it's five. But uh, let's let her uh, explain, uh, which is actually what she has to say is pretty good on CNBC. I mean, it's the question everybody's asking. Why the heck is the stock market holding up as well as it is? And I know it's still down year to date when we're probably going to have 30 million people unemployed in the United States after this morning. Right. This is something I've seen my clients and everyone I talk to really struggle with, which is the concept of we know it's bad out there. I'm sitting in New Canaan, Connecticut right now. And as I look up Main Street or Elm Street, just up this way, Everything is closed. So if everything is closed and businesses are struggling, why is the S&P only down about 11%, 12% right now? I think the S&P, which we've historically relied on as a reflection of U.S. business, is not reflecting U.S. business right now. And I think that we need to remember that the S&P right now has four companies, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and Google, that make up nearly 20% of that index. That's not reflective of what I see here. That's not reflective of what most businesses. So I'm looking at things like the Russell 2000, which is down about 24% on the year, as probably more reflective of what we see broadly out there. I also think it's important to remember yeah. that if you're thinking to yourself, I'm scared, I don't want to invest in the market, you know, it's, it's rallied, it's a disconnect, you don't have to just buy the S&P 500. You can buy individual companies, you can buy other indexes, there's still a lot to do. So let's take a look real quick at what she's talking about here. The S&P 500 versus the Russell 2000. So the S&P 500, take a look at the day, still doing pretty strong for some reason, 28.90 and it's up, 41.67. Let's take a look over five days. Uh, there was a big dip and then it just rallied back. One month, six months, and you can see like it was at a pretty big high right here on February 19th, then took a big crash. And then we're just kind of rebounding up, um, so not too bad. And then the Russell uh, 2000 index, which is a small cap stock market, uh, for here's for one day. It looks like it's doing pretty good. It actually started off not too hot, and then boom, came all the way up. Five days, one month, six month, same type of thing. But it's just going up and up. Uh, I mean, there's little peaks and valleys here, but it's just interesting to me that the traditional market, they're just like, ah, you know what? This is gonna, this is gonna, uh, you know, flow over. No big deal. And uh, I just don't see this correcting anytime soon. Now, what she was talking about is true. I mean, we have these tech companies, like we talked about, uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, and Facebook. They're not really affected so much because they are these textile types of companies. However. I see a huge gap between these tech companies and other companies who took a big hit, like airlines, because people aren't going to fly, and they're not going to fly for a long time. Some are going to get back, but not like it was before. The hospitality business, like Airbnb, restaurants, hotel chains, manufacturing, these types of companies take a big hit, and that's what makes up a big, large portion of what's happening in the United States. I think they just look at the S&P 500 and go, ah, it's doing pretty good, but they don't understand that it's those five companies that are bringing everything up, all these other loot losers, um, you know, with them and just, dr you know, dragging them across the finish line. So I just don't think this is an accurate indicator of what's going on. Let me know what you think in the comments section. I could be totally wrong. So moving forward, the, uh, he's going to ask her, the commentator is going to ask her like, okay, Jenny, well, where are the opportunities? Where do you see uh, the big type of gains? And this is where it gets interesting. Those yeah. opportunities, what specific companies, listen, you're supposed to buy low. You're supposed to buy when others are fearful. It's right. hard and a lot of people are out of work. But these are the times that guys like Warren Buffett have made their fortune. What looks inexpensive to right. you, Jenny? Well, I'll tell you what I added to in my portfolio this week. I added to two companies that are both smaller cap, that are both under the radar, that have both announced earnings and have had terrific numbers. So I added to Compass Diversified Trust and I added to Hercules Technology. These are both essentially private equity plays, but in a publicly traded market. And they have tremendous cash flow. They've been able to sustain their dividends. The dividends are like 9 and 12% on them. Um, and they're just fine and they're under the radar. But they also, because they were in a small cap index, which wasn't the S&P, they've been really depressed in terms of share price. So you can buy things like that. Um, last night, CenturyLink reported. CenturyLink 
has about a 10% dividend yield, trades at nine times earnings, had quite strong revenues. You can buy companies like these. There's a lot to do out there. Um, you can also buy larger cap if you want to. For example, Ab. Yeah, there is a lot to do. And I don't know why all these huge gainers that she was just talking about, like at plus 0.12 and negative 0.01, were the ultimate big plays. Uh, I, I think this is the problem with these traditional financial planners uh, and what they're looking for as far as the market. They get so tunnel visioned into what is right in front of them and what they actually know. If they would branch out and see like, I don't know, this little thing called the digital asset space and what has happened with Bitcoin over the last two years and how it has thumped all the different uh, types of asset classes and has just been a winner uh, over the last uh, two years and the percentage of gains. Now, we know it's volatile, but over the year, you're going to be up big, and that's over most everything. So when she's talking about these things, I just see it as these are just the same people who've done the same thing with the same types of tools that they've always had, and it's just not working for them. Um, now, I, I think later on they could probably do something well, but I just think that if they just open their mind and open their eyes and go, hey, we should probably recommend that, why shouldn't they? And actually, we're going to go into detail about other companies who are actually actively saying, do not buy Bitcoin, do not buy digital assets, uh, because I think they're just manipulating the whole situation. Anyhow, let's move forward. So this gets interesting. Uh, just let me know what you think about this after you hear it. Donkeys pulling the rest of the cart. You know, the FANG stocks, they're the ones that rose and everybody else got left behind. Do you think, like Warren Buffett again said, you know, you want to bet long term on America, is it time to maybe to leave behind some of those big, big winners you've made a lot of money on over the past decade and, and find different opportunities? Should we be sellers as well? I don't know. I think it depends on what the weight in your portfolio is. So let's say you've got Amazon and it's like 10 or 12 percent of your portfolio because it's grown so much. You should definitely be trimming that. That's just not prudent to have that big a position. But if it's 3 percent. That is insane. That's all I'm going to say. That is insane. After everything that's been going on right now, Amazon has skyrocketed. and They've done really good gains. And I think what's going to happen is people are going to see it and be like, wow, let me, let me get this straight. I don't have to go to the store and you can deliver everything to me and the prices are comparable or even cheaper than going out and you can save me time. I think I'm going to start using Amazon maybe a little bit more. And I think Amazon is only going to grow. I mean, let's be honest, Amazon's only going to get out there. So when she's talking about, you should trim your positions at Amazon, are you out of your mind? Uh, now, this is not the channel for traditional markets. I just heard it. I'm like, that's insane. Anyhow, he, but the next part that she talks about is where she's going to get into some future stuff, and I can actually appreciate this. Let's listen. Maybe you hold it. And I do this a lot. I'll see a portfolio come in, and they have these legacy positions. So you can hold those. You don't need to sell them. They also don't need to go up 100% from here for you to have a nice overall return. I like what your earlier guest said earlier, too, about um, IBM. That was, you know, That's a great play. It's safe yield, a big company transforming. Um, so there, again, I, need, I know I keep saying it. There's, there are things yeah. to do. There's investable areas of the market. So we're going to get into IBM in a second. So she talks about it. But she talks about it and she's like, well, it's just a safe company and it's a big company. And I think with these different planners, they're kind of like, well, you know, let's just look at a track record and they've been around for decades. So, yeah, let's go for it. And it's a very safe play. I get it. But uh, I think IBM is actually a bridge company and we'll go into that in just a second. But the last part here is where they talk about cost savings. And it made me realize just how non-forward thinking companies are. Let's take a listen. You know, and what's amazing, we, we rarely talk about both sides of the balance sheet. We talk about obviously the income side, right? Oh, sales were up, profits were up, earnings were up. We forget about the liabilities. Costs are going to come down for a lot of companies. Right. Work from home, everybody's talking about it. JP Morgan, their employees may work from home for the rest of the year. Bank of Montreal, they said 80% of their staff could now be work from home long term, right. if not permanently. Companies are going to be able to save a lot of money in these times as well. Right, not to mention the fact of, of gasoline prices being down so much. Like, here's a surprising one. One of the companies I own is B&G Foods, which reported a great quarter the other day. But what I think is frequently lost is this is ultimately a food distribution company. So the price of oil coming down is actually a really big deal for them. It costs them less yeah. to drive their trucks around, 
even the tires on their trucks cost less a lot and those are based on petroleum products so all and that's pretty much it so when i heard this i'm like you know what it's true all these different companies are like hey we can just teleconference we don't have to actually fly and meet each other or hey a lot of these jobs that we have we can have people work from home and it's a lot cheaper and it's going to be better uh mentally for for some of these uh families <laughs> i mean just depending on you know if you want to get away from your family or not but uh in all honesty i i look at that i'm like that is a non-forward thinking and i remember there was an article seven five six years ago seven years ago and it talked about there was a, a tech firm in california surprise and they were having 50 percent of their staff work from home and everybody thought it was a crazy idea they couldn't believe it was it was doing how can you monitor the people you know they're going to slack off and all these things and they said look people were way more productive they were way more happier and it and it saved us uh, a lot in uh in overhead so like when I hear about this, I'm like, that's true. These companies just don't forward think. And I think this is the same problem with blockchain. If you could look at it and go, wow, we can save a ton of money just doing this blockchain. We don't have to do all these different overhead type of prices. They could have saved a ton of money over the last, you know, two, three, four, five years. They're just slow to the party. And uh, it makes more sense when we, get, when we start to talk about IBM. So let's take a look. So first up, we talked about uh, IBM and their Hyperledger Fabric a couple, couple of days ago. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It, it goes over the top 50 uh, companies that are using blockchain. It's pretty interesting stuff. So we're going to talk about IBM, blockchain, Hyperledger Fabric, and Stellar. And I found this video uh, yesterday, and I thought it was just fascinating the way it's all broken down. So let's take a listen. It's unacceptable that there's 2 billion people in the world who don't have access to financial services. It's totally unacceptable. And that's just the whole thesis for this whole video. And, and it makes sense to me. It's, it's true. Two billion people without access to financial services. That is a travesty, especially in the day and age that we live in. So why can't we do better? And they're going to talk about how they can. Now, remember, this is a big company, IBM. And I was even skeptical myself until I took a listen. If every bank in the world had a correspondent bank account with every other bank in the world, but that's just not realistic, that's not feasible, at least not until now. If everybody is using um, a distributed ledger, a shared ledger, we now have the capacity to represent bank balances on each other in one system. And that's, that's really where the efficiencies come as you eliminate these hops, these, these intermediaries, because now every bank conceptually has a relationship with every other bank in the world. So we built the system that um, that envisions that ultimate outcome. We call that system WorldWire. Uh, so WorldWire is a network uh, of networks that is built on top of the Stellar protocol, which provides a, a blockchain protocol that is tailored and tuned for the transfer of value and for the store of value through the issuance of many different types of digital assets. So first of all, WorldWire sounds to me a lot like Ripple and XRP. So I don't really see so much the difference right now in this part of the video. And just so you know, uh, Hyperledger Fabric is another, another type of blockchain application. It's like an umbrella for different parts of distributed ledger technology that IBM is also into. And again, we took a look at those in detail uh, in this video. But what was interesting about this one, Hyperledger Fabric, is that uh, as far as like this was the Forbes blockchain 50 and we took a look at all these different companies that are using blockchain uh, for a lot of different things as far as like distribution and tracking so like Amazon using Hyperledger Fabric, Ant Financial Hyperledger Fabric, Anthem Hyperledger Fabric, Aeon R3 Corda, Baidu Hyperledger Fabric and you can just see like there's out of these 50 I'd say about 80 percent of them are using Hyperledger Fabric all the way down to Walmart. It was just amazing it was eye-opening to me that they have gotten such a foothold into all these huge corporations and uh, so it was just a, a fascinating uh, find. Anyhow, but back to payments. Uh, Worldwire is for remittances and payments, so we have to make that distinction. And then the big question I had was, well, if we're going to use Stellar, why not just use XRP and Ripple? It's the same thing almost, right? Let's take a listen. We chose Stellar because it has um, thought about scalability. It's rethought the underlying mechanics, and some of them are, are quite complex. You know, we think of distributed computing and consensus algorithms. These are, you know, not trivial things. The other benefit of Stellar 
Stellar provides an amazingly simple way to issue digital assets, which is really paramount to the use and the vision behind the world wire system. Okay, so right there, I still don't get it. Um, I understand what, what, what we're, saying, we're talking about here. It makes a lot of sense, but I don't see much of a difference yet as to Stellar and XRP and Ripple. Now, uh, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but I think they can pretty much do the same things. Remember, uh, Jen McCaleb was, who is the uh, CEO and founder of Stellar, was also co-founder of uh, XRP and Ripple. So um, it's just an interesting uh, dichotomy. Anyhow, let's move on. This next part, if you are really a staunch cheerleader of decentralization and open networks, I don't think you're going to like this. Let's take a listen. Stellar provides a good bridge for us between this purely private network and this completely open Wild West network that we know as, as Bitcoin, where we can actually create a sub-network, if you will, where we can enforce certain rules on the participants, but not give up the transparency and the openness of having an open network. Global payments, at least in the markets where we're starting, which is small value, retail, remittance payments, this needs to be open. Uh, it needs to be transparent because there's thousands of players who could come to the network and add value. So I'm starting to get the differences and I kind of see it as like, XRP is doing a lot of things with the traditional banking system. Uh, this Worldwire is kind of doing the same thing, but a different type of market. So the question is this, is this world big enough for purely decentralized, open, permissionless protocols or and something like this, which in my opinion is a compromise, but it's a good compromise. Uh, is this world big enough for both types where you have like purely decentralized and then some type of like a little bit permissioned, but some type of open? And that's my question. Put in the comment section. It's a deeper type of question and it's probably going to uh, stimulate some interesting conversations, but we'll see. And the last part is we're going to sum up, you know, what the actual goal here is and what really is the difference of the driving points between these two projects. Imagine a world where everybody has money. What does that world look like? And a lot of people um, in the world don't have money, not because they don't have good ideas, but because they don't have access to the networks where the money is exchanged. And that's what we're trying to do is break those barriers down. So when you combine all of what Stellar does and all of what IBM is trying to do with Worldwire and you put those together, now all of a sudden you have a capability that has the potential to really change the world, to have an impact on humanity. And I think that's really cool. So I get it. It looks to me, and tell me if I'm wrong in the comment section, but it looks to me like Stellar is going for the market of to bank the unbanked, the people that have a hard time, that have no access to financial services, that have no access to banks, and they're trying to get them onto their network so that they can uh, interact. Ripple and XRP, on the other hand, are kind of like, hey, let's get the big players to connect and we'll lower their costs and everything else. So that's kind of how I see those two differences. So lastly, the question is this, is there room for both philosophies? Or is it just going to be, there's going to have to be just one banker coin to rule them all? Um, that's the question I have. Let me know in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, latest Bitcoin halving rally puts nail in the coffin on a stock market correlation. And this kind of feeds into the whole halving event that we're going to have right now. So the Bitcoin correlation with S&P 500 may finally be coming to an end. This ought to be interesting. In late February, Bitcoin price uh, went down by 60%. As we all know, in March 12th, 13th, it crashed to the floor. And then it talks about the two assets, being the S&P 500 and, and Bitcoin, have remained lock and key ever since, with each recent peak and trough lining up in sync. That's true. It's lasted now for two full months, but this week they suddenly saw a strong diversions. And this is a nice little chart, and you can see right here that, yep, uh, you had in the red S&P 500 and then the blue the Bitcoin, and it looked like it would rise up and then crash down and then would rise a little bit. But here we see S&P 500 making some gains, but Bitcoin going parabolic, not parabolic, but you know, pretty well. Now this could, this is definitely due to the halving. I can guarantee you that. After the halving, that's the real question. What's gonna happen? So here's my final thoughts. 
If Bitcoin and crypto don't rally, <laughs> then I don't know what to tell you. This is like prime time. The reason Bitcoin was created by Satoshi Nakamoto back in 08 and the white paper was written in 09 was because of the housing market crisis that happened during that time and the banks got bailed out and how awful it was and we needed some type of diversity in what we could actually do and invest in. That's the whole point of Bitcoin. So I don't know if the price will dump or if it'll soar after the halving. One thing I do know is that the price of Bitcoin and the rest of the market, all the digital asset cryptocurrency market, is going to explode over the next 12 to 18 months. So this is the best time for me to keep dollar cost averaging. I can never tell you what to do. I can't tell you what kind of investor or what you wanna do if you wanna go out and leverage and whatever else. Leverage yourself to the hill, I, that, that's up to you. But for me right now, this is the best time just to keep dollar cost averaging in and just it's, Time in is better than timing, and that's just makes sense to me. And now, the only thing that makes me nervous are these institution players. Now, they dumped on us. They dumped on us hard on March 12th and 13th because most of us, uh, well, they, they did it because they had to cover their short positions, and they were playing in both markets. And you know what's liquid? Cryptocurrency digital assets, and they had to liquefy, and they sure did to cover all of their losses. But us, we don't have that problem. We don't liquidate. If you've been in this in this game for any length of time, you've got ice in your veins. And, and you've done this from the years and years of being hard by the market. And most of us wouldn't liquidate. Uh, that's just what I hold to be true. Uh, and the reason why we don't is because we know where this is all headed because we all know about the Bitcoin halving. We all know about the history. We all know what's going on. So we see where it's all leading up to. We wouldn't dump. But those institutional players, they sure will. Now... That's the negative. The positive institutions to me are a double-edged sword. On the positive, they are gonna be our biggest cheerleaders when Bitcoin the digital asset market dominates 2020 yet again, just like it did last year. When this happens, and believe me, it will, and the traditional markets gets rocked, you're gonna see a lot of angry investors from the traditional markets, like the ones that went to Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, and they were told not to buy Bitcoin. They're gonna come back to their, their uh, providers and be like, what did you do to me? You told me not to invest in this emerging asset class because you said it was too risky, and now it's up over 200, 300%, or whatever it's gonna be, I don't know. Uh, and I just lost my tail on this one. You told me to stay in here. What the heck am I paying you for, man? And uh, I think there's going to be some repercussions. And I think those traditional markets are going to have to bend the knee to our assets. Just my thought. Now, if you haven't taken a look, this was the uh, video that we did a couple days ago. JP Morgan Goldman Sachs got caught lying. And uh, they were just telling their, you know, some of their uh, investors don't invest in Bitcoin. Not a good time right now. It's never a good time. It's just trash. And that's what they did. But I got to tell you, as time goes on, we saw in 2019, Bitcoin outperformed all the asset classes. We see this one. It's going to crush the asset classes. I can guarantee that. It's going to beat the S&P 500. It's going to beat oil. It's going to beat gold. It's going to beat everything out there. And when we have all these different factors in play, you're going to see these big type of uh, institutions like Fidelity Digital Assets with 2.4 trillion assets under management. I mean, they're already here. They're already, they're already saying to their, their clients, hey, you got to. They're going to do it even more so coming up. Then you have TD Ameritrade. You've got places like Van Eck, which is a big gold bug type of place. And they have billions under assets under management as well. And they pretty much just said, hey, uh, Bitcoin far beats out gold. And they they put it down here. And I'll try to link it in the, in the description. And they just said why gold is far inferior to Bitcoin. And then you have places like uh, Grayscale. And they're just, they have 2.2 billion assets under management. And their biggest players are institutional investors dominated by hedge funds and that was quarter one of this year and then last year the same thing so all these different things are in play and i firmly believe as this time goes on you are going to see a lot of these institutional players go you know what this is a smart play all right that's it for today's video look stay thanks for sticking with me let's see if uh bitcoin goes above 10k i think it might go this week i don't know when but uh, we'll see so again thanks if you like these videos there'll be two more is going to pop up on your left and right i uh, don't know which ones they are curated for your pleasure by youtube and uh thanks for sticking by see you in the next one